All right, let's look at standard 10. And let's look at the big overall picture. Your student will identify legal, political, and social dimensions of reconstruction. So we're going to be talking about reconstruction. The student will identify legal, political, and social dimensions of reconstruction. There are one, two, three, four, five, six A, B, C, D, E, F substandards under reconstruction. So that's what we'll be doing. Reconstruction lasted from 1865 at the end of the Civil War until 1877, the Compromise of 1877. We're going to talk about that before, before this standard is over with. For 12 years, Reconstruction was in place. All right, I have a timeline of events here. Uh, we're going to look at this as we go through of events that happened during Reconstruction. All right, so 10A. Our focus here on the language of the standards is compare and contrast. Those are the two things we have to do with the compare and then contrast presidential reconstruction with radical Republican reconstruction. So when we finish, you should know what re presidential reconstruction is and then what is radical, re radical Republican reconstruction, how are they alike and how are they different, okay? So our focus on the standards here is reconstruction. Specifically, the elements are presidential reconstruction and Republican reconstruction. And these are political interactions. Okay? All right, so let's start off by saying that Lincoln uh, made a, in 1863, wrote a proclamation of amnesty and reconstruction. And in it, he outlined his plans for reconstructing the United States after the Civil War ended. And many historians refer to this as 10% plan. Uh, we, we, we notice this. We know all this information by reading the Proclamation of Amnesty and Reconstruction. Abraham Lincoln offered a full pardon to those who pledged loyalty to the United States and the Constitution of the United States and then accept the emancipation of slaves. And when 10% of the states that seceded in 1860, when 10% of those states uh, pledged this pardon, then they can come back into the Union. Now, a lot of people thought that this was too lenient of a plan. So they thought that Lincoln's presidential reconstruction was lenient, meaning too easy on the South. But, as we know, Abraham Lincoln did not get a chance to carry out his reconstruction plan because in 1865, John Wilkes Booth assassinated Lincoln in Ford's theater and in the process assassinated his 10% plan. Alright, so on April 15, 1865 Abraham Lincoln was assassinated and his plan was never carried out. Now a lot of historians like to speculate, you know, would it have been lenient? And a lot of people who are in agreement that he would have been easy on the South would point toward his second inaugural address and in that they would point out words like malice toward none with charity for all to bind up the nation's wounds a just and lasting peace among ourselves that his focus would be on a speedy reuniting of the country <clears throat> or a rapid restoration of the seceded states back into the United States to reunite the country would be his major purpose <clears throat> we don't really know that that's speculation but there's a good argument there. Anyway, when he is assassinated by John Wilkes Booth, it, it, the president, the vice president of the United States becomes president, and that is Andrew Johnson. So Andrew Johnson comes into the presidency, and by May of 1865, one month later, he comes up with a reconstruction plan. And in it, he says that wealthy planters had to go through the pardon process with the president grant them a pardon so they had to come to him and pretty much beg him for forgiveness and then the states had to set up these state conventions you know elect delegates and then the delegates in the conventions had to do several things one was repeal secession laws and the secede means to withdraw from we talked about that before uh, they have to repeal those laws in their states and then they have to repudiate all confederate debts and then they had to ratify the 13th Amendment. So a little bit more than what Abraham Lincoln had planned in 1863. But still many people uh, felt that, you know, Johnson was just after this quick or rapid restoration of the seceded states back into the nation. 
just to reunite, reunite the country and bring it back together with not many changes. So presidential reconstruction under Johnson, a lot of people argued, and when I say people, I mean radical Republicans in Congress, argued that it was still too lenient, too easy on the South. So, uh, after, after uh, Johnson begins to reconstruct under his rules, you know, the 13th Amendment had been uh, ratified by December 18, 1865, and then African Americans, in response to this 13th Amendment, now that slavery had been ended, uh, the, and, and, and that 13th Amendment said that no slavery shall exist within the United States, and that was in 1865. We're going to return to this later and talk about it more in detail. But southern states started passing these black, black codes were much like old slave codes in 1865 in response to the freedom granted to African Americans in which they tried to restrict or do away with civil rights that could be acquired by African Americans. In other words, white southerners didn't want to accept blacks as equals, pretty much. So they start passing these black codes and again we're going to talk about these a little bit later in a different video. And then this one in Mississippi, if you're caught loitering or a vagrant within the city and you don't have any employment there or business, uh, you'd be fined fifty dollars. And if you couldn't pay the fifty dollars, the sheriff would hire you out to someone until the fifty dollars was paid. So it was basically a way to re enslave the African American after slavery had been ended. So vagrancy laws or loitering laws would get you locked into jail and then with the fine you couldn't pay it because you were broke in jail so they would send you to the fields or or back on the roads to work it out so you were working nonetheless and a lot of these laws are going to do away with civil liberties and civil rights for African Americans we're going to see that we'll talk about that more in detail later but anyway these these radical Republicans are going to oppose uh, Johnson's reconstruction plan. So they say his reconstruction plan is too lenient and uh, these radical Republicans come out and, and this is what we talk about radical reconstruction of uh, this tug of war and they start winning actually but the definition of radical means in political terms refers to ideas that are not commonly accepted by the majority at that particular time. So, radical Republicans were members of the Republican Party who wanted to give African Americans social equality equivalent to whites during the Reconstruction. That was unheard of and very radical for its time. So, characteristics of this radical or these radical thoughts politically are African Americans should have equality. They should be allowed to vote. They should be elected to office. This is th these are things they had not done so far and see these radical Republicans during Radical Reconstruction want to extend civil liberties and rights to African Americans and make them equivalent to whites. So examples of Radical Republicans are Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania that's this guy here Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania and another example is Charles Sumner of Massachusetts here's Charles Sumner of Massachusetts he was a he was a senator, and Thaddeus Stevens was in House of Representatives representatives of the United States. And non-examples were presidential reconstruction under Lincoln and Johnson, because those two believed that you know no social engineering or the government shouldn't be in the, the, be doing social engineering or guaranteeing civil rights to African Americans such as voting and equality that that should come later that the government had no business doing that. Okay, So an argument ensues and this tug of war happens over Reconstruction. Andrew Johnson tries desperately to exert himself in his Reconstruction plan in, in restoring the United States back to his pre-war status of being one country united, the United States of America. And then the radical Republicans in Congress want to reconstruct the United States as well. And the leader of the uh, 
radical Republicans in the House of Representatives, Thaddeus Stevens, writes this in his argument saying that Congress should reconstruct the United States. Dead states, he's talking about the states that seceded, cannot restore their existence, that is, within the Union. Whose spe special duty is it to do it? Whose special duty is it to do it? In whom does Constitution place the power? Not in the judicial branch of government, for it only adjudicates and does not prescribe laws. Not in the executive, for, the, for he only executes and cannot make laws. Congress is the only power that can act in the matter. And this was a speech in the House of Representatives, December 18, 1865, by this radical Republican that said Congress had the right to do it. Another radical Republican, <coughs> Charles Sumner here, it gives a speech. He says, from the beginning of our history, the country has been afflicted with compromise. It is by compromise that human rights have been abandoned. I insist that this shall cease. The country needs repose after all its trials. It deserves repose, and repose can only be found in everlasting principles. It cannot be found by inserting in your constitution the disfranchisement of a race. And this is what he was saying in the Senate is a speech to get approval of, rat of the 14th Amendment of the United States sending it to be ratified. Alright, so radical Republicans, what did they want? Radical Republicans pretty much wanted a lot of social changes, radical social changes for African Americans. You know, the right to vote, total equality with whites, the right to serve on a jury, anything. None of their rights restricted in any way whatsoever. So this fierce battle over who's going to reconstruct the United States that happens where there's a tug of war between President Andrew Johnson and then this radical Republican Congress and its leaders. So Congress in 1866 passes two laws. One is the Freedmen's Bureau, establishing the Freedmen's Bureau to help African Americans uh, who have been freed get medicine and food and clothing. We're going to talk about that in a few moments. And then this Civil Rights Act up here of 1866, in response to the passage of these black codes, Congress, these radical Republicans, passed this act in response to southern states passing black codes. And in the Civil Rights Act of 1866, it gave African Americans citizenship and equality before the law. And it was forbidding any action of a state to the contrary. So when they passed this law, it went through the House and then it went through the Senate. And it was sent to the President of the United States, who was Andrew Johnson. And when he received it, he vetoed it. He vetoed the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and then the Freedmen's Bureau Act. And he stated that the Congress had never passed bills like this, giving food and medicine and all this to our people, is what he said and so he vetoed the law and, and this is an example of checks and balances that, that you've learned about in civics so he vetoes the law and doesn't sign it into law and in the newspaper they show him in this cartoon here here he is here a cruel uncle is what they call him and he has two children one child here has bureau on his headband this african-american child and and here and that's the Freedmen's Bureau. And here's the Civil Rights. This is a little little girl, white girl here, Civil Rights. And he's leading them into this forest called the Vito Wood, Vito Wood Forest. So they were making uh, him look like a cruel uncle leading them into the Vito field. So what did Congress do in response? It overrode his veto by two thirds vote of both houses. Now. On major legislation, this isn't the first time a veto have, has been overridden by Congress, but on major legislation like the Civil Rights Act of 1866, this is the first time that Congress was able, by a two-thirds vote of both houses, to override a presidential veto. And that's what they did with the Civil Rights Act of 1866. It becomes law. The Free Men's Bureau is put into place. Okay. On July 9, 1868, 
the 14th Amendment will be ratified, but shortly in 1866, right after this Civil Rights Act of 1866 was passed, Congress got together and tried to push through the 14th Amendment because the process it has to go through both houses to be proposed and it eventually is proposed and then it goes to ratification and in 1868 it will be ratified two years later, a year and a half later. So fearing that President Johnson would not enforce the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and fearing that a future Congress would reserve, would reverse the act, uh, radical Republicans in the House and the Senate pushed for the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution and it was ratified in 1868 and there's the language of it. It basically grants citizenship to African Americans and it restricts states from denying any rights to African Americans who are now citizens and then it gives due process of law to African Americans and then equality under the law. Uh, we're going to talk about this 14th Amendment in the, in the videos to come. Alright, so in 1867 uh, after the Civil Rights Act, after the pushing through this proposal for the 14th Amendment, in the House and in, in the House Representatives, Stevens pushed through the Reconstruction Act of 1867. It's finally passed in 1867, and again, here again, they passed this law in in Congress, and it divided the South into five military districts. And let's look at that. Here's a map of the five military districts. We were in number three. Georgia here, the military, the third military district, the fourth was over in Arkansas, Mississippi, the fifth was Louisiana, Texas, North Carolina and South Carolina were the second district, and Virginia was the first district. So this Reconstruction Act passed by the Radical Republicans divides the South into five military districts, and then in each district it gives a commanding general power in that district and each general had the power to override the civilian authorities there and they had to supervise the election and enforce the new changes and make sure all these new amendments were being uh, accepted and put into place. All right, so when they passed this Reconstruction Act of 1867 sure enough they sent it to President Andrew Johnson he vetoes it the Reconstruction Act of 1867 and then he, he sends it back to Congress and then they override his veto again a second time by two-thirds vote of both houses. So we see here that there's this tug of war going on between uh, this tug of war going on between President Andrew Johnson and these radical Republicans in Congress. Now, in 1867, on March the 3rd, one day later, uh, the passage come through of the Tenure of Office Act on March 3rd. And the Tenure of Office Act restricted President Andrew Johnson, or any president, from firing an official who had received Senate confirmation, went to the Senate, got confirmation for the job, without getting the approval of the Senate. So President Johnson could not fire an official without getting the approval of the Senate, pretty much. And so they sent Andrew Johnson after the House and Senate pass it. They sent him. He vetoes this law, the Tenure of Office Act. And once more, he sends it to them. And by two thirds both, two thirds vote of both houses, they override his veto again and put in place the Tenure of Office Act. Now this says he couldn't fire anyone without the consent of the Senate. And it all boiled to a head in 1868, February 28th, when Andrew Johnson became the first president of the United States to be impeached by the House of Representatives. And he had, Andrew Johnson violated the Tenure of Office Act by firing Secretary of War Edwin Stanton without getting Senate approval first. So he violated this new act that, just, that had just been enacted, this Tenure of Office Act here. Tenure of Office Act. And so he fired Secretary of War Edward and Stanton, this guy. And so the House of Representatives, with the leadership of Stevens, that is Stevens here, this radical Republican, impeached Andrew Jackson. In other words, formally charged him 
and the articles of impeachment there were 13 but really they just boiled down to one that he fired this guy in violation of the tenure office act so the trial of Andrew Johnson the first president of the United States to be impeached goes to the senate and then in this trial they acquitted him and acquitted means found not guilty so he stayed in office he was not removed by one vote one simple vote and we'll talk about that impeachment a little bit more later all right so our job was to compare and contrast presidential reconstruction with radical republican reconstruction the major goal of presidential reconstruction was to reunite the united states rapidly to just get it back together you know it had been torn apart it's just put everything back together and become one again but the radical republicans wanted more they were a little bit beyond the norm they wanted to guarantee civil rights to African Americans that was their main goal and the plan uh, with presidential reconstruction with Johnson and Lincoln was to make the southern states accept the 13th amendment end in slavery and the slavery was the biggest issue that westward expansion of slavery causing all these problems so just accept that and let's move forward let's tie up the nation's wounds move forward in unity and see over here in the radical Republican Reconstruction, they wanted more to do, more than just to do that. They wanted social equality, true social equality for African Americans. Give them the right to vote. Let them be have an equal stance with whites. And some Southerners could not accept this, but that's radical Republican Reconstruction. Social equality, presidential Reconstruction. Johnson argued that that was not the job of the United States government. To, it, was, it was not the job of the government to practice social engineering to make people equal that's not our job and the radical Republicans disagree with him they believe government should protect African Americans aggressively providing equality for them and so we see the 14th and the 15th amendment is going to be pushed through by these radical Republicans over here so to summarize here presidential reconstruction was looked at as too lenient or too easy on the south and then radical Republican Reconstruction was pretty much they wanted social changes, dramatic and radical social changes for African Americans and African American equality. I hope we've met our objective. And I hope you understand this. If not, you know, just rewind this. I mean, just rewatch this video and ask questions in class. But our objective was to compare and contrast presidential Reconstruction with Republican Reconstruction. Good luck on the quiz and the OCT. And when 10% of the states that seceded in 1860, it, when 10% of those states uh, place this pardon, then they can come back into the Union. Now, a lot of people thought that this was too lenient of a plan. So they thought that Lincoln's presidential reconstruction was lenient, meaning too easy on the South. But, as we know, Abraham Lincoln did not get a chance to carry out his Reconstruction plan because in 1865, John Wilkes Booth assassinated Lincoln in Ford's Theater and in the process assassinated his 10% plan. Alright, so on April 15, 1865, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated and his plan was never carried out. Now, a lot of historians like to speculate, you know, would it have been lenient? And a lot of people who are in agreement that he would have been easy on the South would point toward his second inaugural address. And in that, they would point out words like malice toward none with charity for all, to bind up the nation's wounds, a just and lasting peace among ourselves. That his focus would be on a speedy reuniting of the country. <clears throat> or a rapid restoration of the seceded states back into the United States to reunite and reconstruction. And these are political interactions. Okay? Alright, so let's start off by saying that <clears throat> Lincoln uh, made a, in 1863, wrote a proclamation of amnesty and reconstruction. And in it, he outlined his plans for reconstructing the United States after the Civil War ended. And many historians refer to this as 10% plan. Uh, we, we, we notice this. We know all this information by reading the Proclamation of Amnesty and Reconstruction. Abraham Lincoln offered a full pardon to those who pledged loyalty to the United States 
and the Constitution of the United States and then accept the emancipation of slaves. I have a timeline of events here. Uh, we're going to look at this as we go through of events that happened during Reconstruction. All right. So 10a, our focus here on the language of the standards is compare and contrast. Those are the two things we have to do with compare and then contrast presidential reconstruction with radical Republican reconstruction. So when we finish you should know what re presidential reconstruction is and then what is radical re radical Republican reconstruction. How are they alike and how are they different? Okay. So our focus on the standards here is reconstruction. Specifically, the elements are presidential reconstruction and Republican. All right, let's look at standard 10. And let's look at the big overall picture. Your student will identify legal, political, and social dimensions of reconstruction. So we're going to be talking about reconstruction. The student will identify legal, political, and social dimensions of reconstruction. There are one, two, three, four, five, six A, B, C, D, E, F substandards under reconstruction. So that's what we'll be doing. Reconstruction lasted from 1865 at the end of the Civil War until 1877, the Compromise of 1877. We're going to talk about that before, before this standard's over with. For 12 years, Reconstruction was in place. All right, 